Friends, welcome to our Caltech Astronomy September public lecture and, and stargazing, although it'll be a virtual stargazing. Uh, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a researcher in the department doing computational astrophysics in the Caltech Astronomy and Astrophysics Department, and I will be the MC for this evening. Uh, if this is your first event, I'll give you a quick rundown of our schedule for tonight. Let's see, I'll stop sharing this screen. Yeah, so I will, uh, I'll have a few announcements initially, and then we will, let's see, I'll have a few announcements. I'll, I'll show you guys a visualization of what the sky looks like tonight in case you did plan to go out and, and look at the sky. Um, and then I'll introduce our speaker, Michael Jang, a PhD candidate in the department who's gonna talk about the discoveries of the, of the Greeks, the astronomical discoveries of the Greeks. And that'll be about 30 minutes long, followed directly by a Q&A panel consisting of Michael, myself, and two scientists from our department, Dr. Emruda Jaudand, who is um, a postdoc who does observational studies of neutron stars and other uh, compact objects, and Nikita Kamraj, who is a uh, graduate student doing some really awesome work with uh, transient events and, 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 and that sort of thing in explosions in the universe. So uh, we do these events once a month, and our next one will be October 9th about dark energy and how to prove Einstein wrong. Uh, I've already made the event in our, our calendar, so you can, you, can, you can check that out right now or, or after on our YouTube channel. In addition, we, we have events called Astronomy on Tap that happen once a month. These are traditionally less formal. They usually happen in a bar, but of course, since the pandemic, we're doing them live on YouTube. But it's still kind of bar-like. We have two 15-minute talks given by scientists about uh, space science, astronomy, physics, and so on and so forth. And then we do pub trivia afterwards, and it's interactive, so you can answer and we'll see your responses, and it's, it's super fun. So our next one of those will be in three weeks. It's also already announced in our YouTube uh, channel. It'll be, uh, our two speakers will be Dr. Jackie Faherty, who's a prominent stellar astronomer at the American Museum of Natural History, works a lot with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and, and Dr. Constantine Batigan, who's a professor at Caltech who does planetary studies, solar system studies, and he's one of the main uh, people who conjectured the existence of Planet Nine in the outer solar system, this like uh, predicted large planet in the outer solar system that hasn't yet been observed, but there's reason to believe that it, is, it, uh, that it, it exists. And he's going to talk about that. Uh, and Jackie's going to talk about similar like solar system studies and, and, and uh, brown dwarf studies around the solar system. So it should be really cool. Uh, I think those are all my main announcements. So yeah, uh, as I said, normally these events have a stargazing component, which we're not actually able to do because we're on computers. But uh, it's nice to, to show you guys what the sky looks like. Um, so in case you're, you're, you're up late at night and you want to see what the sky, what the sky actually looks like, um, or see what, not what the sky looks like, but what, what you're looking at when you look up in the sky. So there's actually, it's a shame that we aren't able to do these stargazing events in person because there's a lot of really cool stuff to see right now. So this is looking at the sky from here in Pasadena at uh, 11 o'clock tonight. Let's, let's make it, let's make it, I'm sorry, at eight o'clock tonight. Here's eight o'clock. And you may notice this is using a free software tool. Um, you can find the link in the description below. It's, uh, it's called Stellarium. It's a free sky visualization tool. You can download it for Mac or Windows or, um, or Linux, and, it, and it, it's great. I've used it for quite a while. I, I really like it. But the obvious thing that you can see is in the southern part of the sky for the first half of the night, probably until like one or so in the morning, you can see what looks like two bright stars. And what you're actually looking at are, are two planets. You're looking at Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter being the brightest of the two. And if you were able to zoom in, 
That is to say, you, you had some sort of telescope or even binoculars would work quite well. Zoom in on Jupiter, you'd be able to potentially resolve the structure and see some of the banding on Jupiter. Even with, yeah, even with like, you know, a set of binoculars, you can, you can start to see this stuff, stuff. You can also see what look like four, they usually are in, in kind of a line for what look like stars or, or just white tiny dots. Those are actually the Galilean moons, the uh, four moons that orbit around Jupiter that were discovered by Galileo 400 years ago. So that's why they're named after him. And similarly, if you were to look at Saturn, which is right next to Jupiter on the sky right now, and again, zoom in, even with a modest telescope, you can, you can make out the rings. Um, they look kind of like ears on the side. You can definitely tell that it's not a, a circular looking object. And uh, it's super cool. And if you have a decent telescope, you can start to make out the bands in between the different ring structures, which I think is, is awesome. So, um, I mean, there's lots to see and I don't wanna to take too long on this. I definitely wanted to announce those two objects to keep an eye out for. If you're one who doesn't like to stay up late and rather get up early, if you stay up, stay up later, so at about midnight or so, you'll see Mars rise and right next to the moon. The moon's quite bright, it's almost full. We had full moon a couple of days ago, so it's still bright in the sky. Mars has a very distinctive red color to it, uh, so you can identify it pretty readily because it's, uh, it's different than the other objects. It's bright and red. Um, and if you stay up later, so this is at 5 a.m. You can see Venus. Venus is quite bright. It's even brighter than Jupiter was. Unfortunately, when you zoom in on Venus, um, it's not as spectacular. It shows as phases like the, like the moon does, depending on the side that's being illuminated by the sun. But um, it's not, not as spectacular, as I said, as, as Jupiter or Saturn, or even as Mars, really. Um, and oh, I, I guess I'll just point out one other cool thing that you can see, especially in the morning or around midnight, past midnight, and that's the Andromeda galaxy. Um, so I guess it's kind of difficult to see, especially if I'm flipping this thing around. That's why I encourage you to, to, um, to download this software. There are also some pieces of software that you can download for your phone that when you point the, many of you may have it already, when you point it up at the sky, it'll tell you what you're looking at, or you can say like, point me towards Mars and it'll it'll direct your phone as to where to, to point your phone to be able to see Mars on the sky. So it's quite useful. And again, there are some links in the description for a couple of those tools that I've found to be useful. Um, unfortunately, they're like three or four bucks to download, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, um, the Andromeda galaxy is, is right off of the constellation of Cassiopeia. And you can see it here. And if you're in a dark enough sky like certainly a national park like Joshua Tree or Death Valley or just the middle of nowhere, then you can usually make this out. And it's really spectacular. Even, even if you have a dark enough sky, you can make this out without any kind of aid to your eye. You can see it, I mean, maybe not at this level of detail, but you can definitely notice an extended object on the sky that is this galaxy. This is our nearest kind of massive galaxy neighbor, kind of people think of it as the Milky Way's twin or the Milky Way's big sister because it's, uh, it's very similar in structure to the Milky Way, but it's, it's a little bit bigger, but it's, uh, it's really spectacular and dramatic. So I'll leave it at that. There's other stuff that you can see on the sky, but I encourage you to, to, to check out one of the programs that I've suggested. And again, there are links in the description for, for where to get those and yeah, check them out. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Michael, do you want to do you want to unmute and bring your camera back online? I like your, is that a real statue or is that just an image behind you? <laughs> no, that's just an image. It's oh, Aristotle okay. looking down on me. Okay. I, I was going to say, that's a pretty intense place to be giving your presentation with an actual Aristotelian <laughs> statue. Yeah. Looking looking at me with the stain. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, Michael Jong is a graduate student in Caltech astronomy. He studies the atmospheres of small planets orbiting other stars through a combination of simulation and observation. And currently he's trying to measure helium in these escaping atmospheres. Um, while Michael is not a professional historian and doesn't have a formalized education in the field of history, he's a super enthusiastic history buff who's done a ton of reading 
about uh, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Rome, uh, the history of Rome. And that's what he's going to talk to us about. Roma Invicta. So um, I, will, uh, I will let you take it away. Do you want to share your screen, Michael? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Looks okay. great. Awesome. You see my screen, right? Yes, it looks great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming to my lecture about ancient Greek astronomy. Now, the word astronomy itself comes from the ancient Greek astronomia, meaning the laws of the stars. So the first Greek civilization to exist was the Mycenaean. This civilization uh, emerged around 1400 BC in roughly the area that we call modern Greece. Um, this civilization was wealthy, it was powerful, and it was well connected by trade, both with themselves and with their neighbors in the Mediterranean world. On the upper right, you see an example of Mycenaean pottery. It's very high quality, it's very well decorated, and you find it all across the Mediterranean, from Spain to Egypt, indicating the existence of long distance trade. On the bottom right, you see an example of uh, Mycenaean monumental architecture. So this is a royal tomb in Mycenae. You can see that it's made out of gigantic stones. And if you go inside the tomb, well, before archaeologists came, you would have seen a lot, of, a lot of jewelry. And you would have seen this mask. It's made out of gold, and it's, made out, it's called the Mask of Agamemnon. So all of this attests to the wealth and power of the Mycenaean kings. But beginning in 1200 BC, a mysterious apocalypse happened, which plunged Greece into a 400 year dark age. We don't know what caused it. From the inscriptions, we hear about a confederation of nomadic peoples called the Sea Peoples, raiding cities all across the Eastern Mediterranean. From the archeological record, uh, we see that the inhabitants are strengthen strengthening their already formidable walls. So obviously they were afraid of something. We also have letters written uh, from one king to another, begging for military assistance. But if the military assistance ever came, it wasn't enough. Because within a hundred years, almost every single city in the Eastern Mediterranean outside of Egypt burned to the ground. In 1100 BC, the population was 10% what it was in 1200 BC. There was a drastic reduction in material prosperity. Instead of this nice, you know, very ornate pottery, you have this kind of pottery, which is ugly and it's simple, and it's also very localized. If you see it in Athens, you don't see it in Mycenae, because long distance trade completely collapsed. Even more dramatically, writing was completely lost. They forgot how to write. And along with writing, uh, any historical memory of the Mycenaean civilization was completely lost to the Greeks. It wouldn't be rediscovered until the 19th century. Well, the Dark Ages lasted about 400 years. By 800 BC, Greece was starting to emerge out of the darkness and into the light of a brave new world. They did something characteristically Greek which is they learned from the civilizations surrounding them, which at this point in their history were bigger, wealthier, older, and wider than they were. But they weren't happy to just be students. Whatever they learned, they improved upon. So a prime example is the Greek alphabet. Now the Greeks lost their original writing system due to the uh, dark ages. So they took the, the Phoenician writing system which is kind of like an alphabet, but it doesn't have vowels. And they added vowels to it, thereby inventing the first alphabet in human history. This alphabet is the ancestor of all European alphabets today. Okay, so in 800 BC, there was something else very unique about the Greek world. They no longer lived in large empires ruled by all powerful kings, uh, ruling by divine right. That's the overwhelmingly common form of government throughout all civilization for all time until very, very recently. Well, the Greeks didn't live like that. Instead, they lived in hundreds of city-states. Each city-state had its own government, its own military, and its own foreign policy. 
So this was a very young civilization, just emerging into a very dangerous world, dominated by much more powerful civilizations. They didn't have hundreds of years to, of tradition to fall back upon. They had to make their own way. And this created an environment of unprecedented intellectual freedom. If the Athenians didn't like what you were saying because you offended their gods, that's fine, you can move to Corinth. If the Corinthians were also offended at what you had to say, that's fine, you can move to Miletus. Well, Miletus. But 800 BC was not yet a time of science. It was still a time of myth. Our word myth comes from the Greek word muthos, meaning a story or a tale or a legend. So here's an example of muthos. This is from Hesiod's The Agony, or Birth of the Gods, written around 700 BC. First of all, chaos came into being, but then Gaia broadcasted, always the unshakable seat of all the immortals who hold the peaks of snowy Olympics, and dark Tartarus in the recesses of the wide wide earth, and Eros, the most beautiful among the immortal gods. Okay, so how did the universe come into being? Well, one god uh, gave birth to another, and then another, and soon enough, you have this huge family tree. How does Hesia know that this is what happened? It's not because he formed a hypothesis and he took measurements and he applied the Pythagorean theorem. No, 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 none of that. He know that this is what, knows that this is what happened because that's the tradition of his people. It's what his people have always uh, behaved, always believed. Now, if the Greeks were just an ordinary civilization, their intellectual history would have begun and ended with Muthos. But the Greeks were not an ordinary civilization. They were destined for much greater things. In the sixth century BC, they invented a new way of understanding the world. Logos, meaning logic or reason. Now, the first, pe the first people to adopt this new approach were the, uh, the Ionian Greeks. Ionia is a portion of what is now Turkey. It's on the Western coast. And it's this green region that you see over here. The Ionian Greeks are descendants of refugees who fled from mainland Greece in the aftermath of the apocalypse that destroyed their civilization. The first philosopher that we hear about is Thales of Miletus. Miletus, Miletus is right here. Thales thought that the origin of all reality is water. Now, in case you're wondering, that's not actually true, uh, but let's give him a break, right? He's the first philosopher in Greece and he's trying his best. According to legend, Thales predicted the total solar eclipse of 585 BC. Now, there's no way that that could be true because we now know that he didn't have the technology or the techniques or the knowledge to do such a thing. But he did probably discover static electricity by rubbing amber with silk. Um, and also he did that characteristic Greek thing again, which is he learned mathematics from the Egyptians and the Babylonians, but he wasn't satisfied to just be a student. He improved upon what he learned by proving the Egyptian and Babylonian results rigorously, starting from first principles. The first great astronomer from the, the Ionian school was Anaxagoras of Plato Mine. Plato Mine is right here. Anaxagoras thought that the Earth is a flat disk suspended on air. He thought that the sun is a hot stone the size of the Peloponnesus. Now that actually got him into a lot of trouble with the Athenians because he moved to Athens to do his work. But then the Athenians accused him of impiety for saying that the sun is not a god. So they chased him out of town and he had to go live in Lampascus over here. Now, he was actually probably not chased out of Athens because of his astronomy. Uh, it's probably because he was friends with Pericles, who was the disgraced former leader of democratic Athens. And in democratic Athens, they throw their leaders under the bus whenever anything goes wrong. It doesn't matter whether the, it's the leader's fault or not. So Anaxagoras got caught up in that and he got basically chased out of town. Anaxagoras was also the first person to correctly explain the lunar and solar eclipses. He also thought that the moon is a world like ours, 
that it has mountains, plains, ravines, and even people in it. As far as we know, he was the first person to speculate about alien life. Okay, one of the most interesting people in ancient Greece were probably the Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans were a mathematical cult. That's not something you see every day. Um, the cult was founded by Pythagoras of Samos, Samos being an island just off the Ionian coast. But he moved to Croton to do his work. Croton is um, a Greek colony in Southern Italy. So his cult worshiped numbers, especially whole numbers like one, two, three, four, because those are the building blocks of all reality. They especially worship the number one, presumably because from the number one, you can build up to all of the other numbers. They believed in, they had wacky beliefs like transmigration of the soul and vegetarianism and gender equality, which at that time would have probably been the most radical belief. And also they really hated beans. Now you might know the Pythagoreans from the Pythagorean theorem because the Pythagoreans were so, you know, they worship numbers so much that they became very good mathematicians. The Pythagoreans also had interesting math astronomical beliefs. They were the first people that we know about to believe that Earth is a sphere. They thought that all of the planets, including the Earth, revolved around a central fire. Now, the central fire is not the sun, because they thought that the sun also went around the central fire. He thought that the planets were held on crystal spheres, making music as they orbited, orbited the fire. Now, whether he came to any of these beliefs um, scientifically or entirely mystically, we have no idea. What we do know is that by the time of Aristotle, who was probably the greatest scientist that ancient Greece produced, uh, by the time of Aristotle, it had become common knowledge that the earth is a sphere. In his book on the heavens, Aristotle gives five arguments for why the earth is round. So let's go through them. Number one, for every portion of earth has weight until it reaches the center. So Aristotle believed that earth is the center of the universe and that everything heavy, all you know, dirt, all rocks, all water, um, they all want to get as close to the center of the universe as possible. So if Earth was any other shape than a sphere, then some part of the, uh, of the Earth will be farther from the center than they need to be. So they're gonna move until that's no longer the case. Because only with a sphere is every portion of the Earth um, as close to the center as it could possibly be. Now, his theory of gravity is incorrect. Uh, it's not actually true that Earth is the center of the universe. Uh, but it is true that his explanation is logical. If you ask a physicist today why the planets are spherical, they're going to give you a very similar answer. Uh, they, might, they might say hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying the same thing. Okay, reason number two. How else would eclipses of the moon show segments shaped as we see them? Okay, very good point. Number three. There is much change, I mean, in the stars which are overhead, and the stars seen are different as one moves northward or southward. Now, if you go to Australia, you're going to see this very, very obviously. Uh, this is very hard to explain that if you think the Earth is flat. Number four, the case of elephants, a species occurring in each of these extreme regions, suggesting that the common characteristic of these extremes is explained by their continuity. Now, in the ancient world, there were elephants both in modern Morocco and in India. These were the two extremes of the world that the Greeks knew. So what Aristotle is saying is maybe that's because Morocco and India are connected on the opposite side of the globe. Now, little did he know, these are actually two different species of elephants. And also, the distance between Morocco and India is not that, you know, not that far. Interestingly enough, he also has some idea how big the Earth is. Because number five, the fifth argument, is those mathematicians who try to calculate the size of Earth's circumference arrive at the figure 400,000 states. This indicates not only that the Earth's mass is spherical in shape, 
but also that as compared with the stars, it is not of great size. Now, 400,000 stages is about 70% too big, but it's close enough to being the right answer that the mathematicians probably didn't just guess. They probably had a method of measuring this. Unfortunately, we have no idea who the mathematicians were or how they measured what they did. Okay, so Aristotle was the, was the last great scientist from the age of the city state. In the mid fourth century BC, Philip II of Macedon uh, invented ingenious new military tactics and combined it with a professional army to subjugate almost all of the city states of mainland Greece, including the great cities of Athens and Thebes. And then he got assassinated. Uh, we don't know by who, we don't know why, but whoever assassinated him probably thought that his son would be, you know, would not be half as intelligent or capable or ambitious as he was. Well, unfortunately for the assassin, uh, Philip's son was Alexander the Great, a former pupil of uh, Aristotle and also the greatest military genius that history has ever known. In less than a decade, he conquered a vast empire stretching from the Adriatic Sea in the west to the Indus River in the east. And the only reason that he didn't conquer India is because his troops uh, forced him to turn back and refused to go any further. So he went back, he went to Babylon and he died there in 323 BC. Upon his death, his generals divided up his empire into three portions. The Antigonid Empire controlled mainland Greece the Ptolemaic Empire controlled Egypt, and the Seleucid Empire controlled the Middle East. Alexander founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, the first king of the Ptolemaic dynasty commissioned a great library. Within a very short time, Alexandria became one of the biggest, you know, busiest, the most populated, and richest cities of the ancient Mediterranean. After the Great Library, it also became the center of learning in the Greek world. One of the people that the Great Library attracted was Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes was born in Cyrene, which is a Greek colony in modern day Libya. He was invited to work in the Great Library and very quickly he um, rose up the ranks to become chief librarian. As chief librarian, he was looking through the scrolls and he found a scroll that said on um, noon of the summer solstice in a city called Syene, which is due south from Alexandria, the sun shines straight down the water wells. Now he lives in Alexandria. He knows that that's not the case in Alexandria. So he waited for the next summer solstice. He put a stick into the ground uh, and he measured the length of the cast shadow that the stick casted. From the lens of the shadow and the lens of the stick, he could calculate that this angle, the angle that the sunlight made with the stick is 7.2 degrees away from vertical. So that's this angle right here. And you can convince yourself that this angle is the same as this angle. Now, Eratosthenes also knew that the distance from Alexandria to Syene is about 5,000 stadia, because there were government surveys that measure that kind of thing. So if 7.2 degrees, which is 1 50th of a circle, corresponds to 5,000 stadia, then what does a full circle correspond to? Well, it's going to be 5,000 times uh, 50 stadia, or 250,000 stadia. We don't know precisely how long a stadium is. If he used the Egyptian stadium, then his result will be accurate to within 1%. If he used the Olympic stadium, his result will be off by 20%. But let's put it in context. Even 20% is really, really good for 200 BC, uh, especially considering that at the time, there was no other ancient civilization that even knew the Earth was round. But measuring the Earth was not the most impressive thing that the ancient Greeks did, not by far. Irish targets of Samos try to measure the distance and sizes of the moon and the sun. And here's a simplified version of how he did it. 
During a lunar eclipse, the moon goes behind the shadow of the earth. Now, if the sun is really far away, like almost infinitely far away, then the side of the Earth's shadow is going to be equal to the diameter of the Earth. So all you have to do is you have to measure how long it takes for the moon to uh, go from not eclipsed to fully consumed by eclipse. So how long it takes for the shadow to consume the moon. And then you measure how long it takes for the, for the moon to crush the whole shadow. And the ratio between those two durations is the ratio between the moon and the earth. And that turns out to be around one in three. Now, if you know how big the earth is, which Aristarchus did, then you can figure out how big the moon is. Once you know how big the moon is in real physical units, you can, you can find out how far away it is. Um, Cause you know how big the moon appears on the sky. And if it's a lot further, it would appear smaller. If it's a lot closer, it would appear bigger. There's only one distance at which it appears to be the same size as you measure it to be. Okay, so now you have the size and distance of the moon. How do you get the size and, size and distance of the sun? Well, you wait until the moment of quarter moon. A quarter moon from people, people on Earth uh, see half of the day side of the moon and half of the night side. So this angle right here has to be 90 degrees. Um, if you can measure this angle right here, then you can use trigonometry to find the ratio between the solar distance and the lunar distance. Now, I say that, but Aristarchus didn't have trigonometry because it hadn't been invented yet. So he had to invent a lot of trigonometry just to be able to do his problem. But he did so, and he got the answer. It's actually a lot more complicated. Um, you could do it with high school geometry, but it takes a lot of time to explain. So the actual geometry is left as an exercise for the listener. Okay, so here are his results. You see that he got the radius of the moon pretty accurately, but his other numbers are way off. And that's not because his method was bad. That's because his measurements were bad because the ancient Greeks did not have the technology to make this kind of measurement accurately. But you see that even with Aristarchus's numbers, the sun is seven times bigger than the earth in radius. So the sun is really much, much bigger than the earth. And that could be one reason why Aristarchus became the first heliocentrist, the first person to propose that the planets went around the sun instead of the earth. Here's what Archimedes says in his book, The Sand Reckoner. Aristarchus of Samos brought out a book consisting of some hypotheses in which the premises lead to the result that the universe is many times greater than that now so-called. His hypotheses are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves around the sun in the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the middle of the orbit. Okay, so that's a very clear statement of heliocentrism. But there's a problem with any heliocentric theory, and that's a problem of stellar parallax. Parallax is the phenomenon where nearby objects appear to change position depending on your viewpoint. So if you stick your finger out like this, and you close one eye, um, and then you close the other eye, depending on which eye you have open, the, your finger is going to appear to move back and forth. And that's a phenomenon of parallax. Now, if the Earth is actually moving, how come we don't see any parallax for the stars? How come the stars don't move with respect to the other stars in the sky? Now, there are two ways you can answer this. Number one, you could say that the stars are very far away. So you, there is parallax, but we just don't see it. That was the approach that Aristarchus took. The second approach is that you can say heliocentrism is wrong. The Earth is not actually moving. It has to be fixed. And that was the approach that Aristotle took. Well, Aristotle won the argument. Heliocentrism will never become widely accepted in the ancient Greek world. But parallax is not just a curiosity or an annoyance. From antiquity right up until the modern day, it has been the method 
uh, by which we measure the universe. Every astronomical distance that you ever read, if it's more than a light year, you can almost guarantee that it was calculated by parallax. Maybe not directly, but at least indirectly. So it's very fitting that the first person to use parallax to measure the universe was the greatest astronomer of the ancient Greek world, Hipparchus of Nicaea. Now, Hipparchus of Nicaea invented so many things, discovered so many things that I can't possibly be described all of them. Uh, he is called the founder of trigonometry. He discovered the precession of the parallax of the equinoxes. He came up with the um, system for measuring stellar brightnesses that we still use today. But probably the most impressive thing he did was that he used parallax to measure the size and distance of the moon. And here's how he did it. There was a total solar eclipse. It was total in the Hellespont, but it was not total in Alexandria. One fifth of the sun was still not covered by the moon. And that's because the apparent position of the moon is different depending on your viewpoint. Now, one fifth of the solar diameter is 0 0.11 degrees. So this angle right here has to be 0 0.11 degrees. Now, they knew that the distance from the Hellespont to Alexandria is about 1,100 kilometers. So if this distance is 1,100 kilometers and this angle is 0 0.11 degrees, then what is the length of this side? Well, if you know trigonometry, which Hipparchus did because he invented a lot of it, uh, then you can figure out the answer. Once you know the distance of the moon, you can calculate the radius because you know how big the moon appears to be on the sky. Okay, uh, it's a lot more complicated than this. Hipparchus did it rigorously, properly, and the full derivation is left as an exercise for the listener. Because if you can't tell already, the ancient Greeks were very, very good at, astron at um, geometry. Okay, so here are the results that he got. Um, he got pure, pretty accurate values for both the size of the moon and the distance to the moon. Uh, both of these values are accurate to within 20%. He also tried to calculate the size and distance of the sun. But as Ptolemy says, with respect to the sun, not only the amount of its parallax, but also whether it shows any parallax at all is altogether doubtful. From the fact that he couldn't measure any parallax, he could tell that the sun has to be more than 490 Earth radii away. Because if it's less than that, he would, sorry, he would have measured it. From this lower limit on the distance and the, the apparent size of the sun, he could uh, measure the, he could calculate the radius of the sun. It has to be more than 12 times bigger than the Earth. So Hipparchus's universe is even bigger than Aristarchus's. The last great ancient astronomer was Ptolemy of Alexandria, who lived in what was now um, Roman Egypt. Ptolemy's magnum opus was the Almagest which is Arabic for the greatest, because it was the Arabs who translated it in the Middle Ages. Now, the Almagest summarizes the accomplishments of previous astronomers like Apollonius, Aristarchus, and Hipparchus. Its greatest accomplishment was that it derived a geocentric system of the solar system um, that explained the observations to very high accuracy. Now, if you just have a very naive geocentric model where the planets circle the Earth, you know, in a circle at uniform speed, it's very clear that that cannot match the observations. Because if you just look at the planets, they don't move in the same direction. Sometimes they move in this direction and then they stop. And then they start moving in the opposite direction. They stop again. And then they resume moving in the first direction. So they do a loop-de-loop. -loop. Um, Aristarchus, no, well, Apollonius and Hipparchus fixed this problem by invoking an epicycle. So under this system, the planets orbit imaginary points in tiny circles. And the center of these tiny circles orbit the Earth in a bigger circle. Ptolemy realized that even this was not accurate enough. So he introduced the equant. So in his system, 
um, the, upper, the center of the upper cycles orbit a second imaginary point, which is marked by this X over here. On one side of this second imaginary point is the Earth. Uh, equally distant on the opposite side is a third imaginary point called the equant. The speed at which the epicycle orbits um, is constant as seen from the equant, but not as seen from the X or as seen from the Earth. Okay, so if you think that this system is complicated and ugly and like, why the hell would you do this? Then yeah, you're right. The ancient astronomers would have agreed with you. But nobody could do any better for the next 1,500 years. Ptolemy was the last astronomer to make any substantial contribution uh, to the progress of the field. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, everything the ancient Greeks did was useless. Instead, the discoveries of the ancient Greeks, not only in astronomy, but also in mathematics, in philosophy, in politics, in, philo in um, all of these fields spread far and wide. They spread to Europe, they spread to the Middle East, and they spread even to India, insp inspiring many, many centuries of scholars. The next great improvement uh, to the Ptolemaic model of the solar system came from Johannes Kepler in the 16th century AD. Kepler was the first person to come up with a heliocentric model that matched the observations better than the Ptolemaic model. He said that the planets orbit the sun in ellipses, not in circles. Now, how did he come up with his model? Well, he relied almost entirely on ancient Greek mathematics, especially on Euclid's Elements, which is a geometry textbook published in 300 BC that would never, um, that would always be published all the way until the present day. There are more editions of Euclid's Elements than of any other book other than the Bible. The whole reason that Kepler knew about ellipses was because the ancient Greeks studied them, especially Apollonius of Perga and Archimedes of Syracuse. Um, and also, and this is um, very interesting, he actually derived this model by starting from the Ptolemaic model like, uh, as a basis. So he took the Ptolemaic model, he transformed it to the solar frame, and then he made adjustments until he could fit the data. And after he could fit the data, he noticed, wow, I'm describing an ellipse with this elaborate thing that I constructed. So people like Kepler, Galileo, and Newton inaugurated the scientific revolution. Unlike the Ionian Enlightenment, the scientific revolution would not stop. It would not stall. You know, discovery will build upon discovery all the way until the present day giving us the modern world that we all love and enjoy and take for granted. And for that, we owe the ancient Greeks a huge debt of gratitude. Okay, yeah, that's my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. And we'll take questions. That was, that was excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, Emruta and Nikita, can you guys turn on your, your cameras? So yeah, we encourage the audience to ask questions in the in the YouTube comment section, and we'll try and address them. You can ask questions regarding the content of Michael's talk, re regarding the the many amazing astronomical discoveries that the Greeks made, or uh, we'll also take questions on anything related to astronomy, astrophysics, space science, you know, any anything that we can we can deal with. We have two. PhD astronomers here and two soon to be PhD astronomers in the next couple of years. Uh, so who all work on a variety of different topics. So we're happy to address whatever, whatever you want to throw at us. Um, but before we, before we start taking questions, I just like uh, each of our panelists to kind of give a little introduction of who they are and what kind of science they deal with. And we'll actually get a little introduction from Michael as well, since Michael, you were just talking about a really interesting subject, but history isn't exactly what you're going to get your PhD in. It's it's more on uh, on exoplanets. So, um, uh, so go ahead. I'll I'll let you speak first, and then and then we can we can pass through uh, Nikita and Emruta. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So I don't actually study uh, the ancient Greeks or even any history at all. 
Uh, what I study is the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. I'm especially interested in small planets, planets like the Earth, or maybe slightly bigger. I'm trying to study the, uh, their atmospheres by um, looking at them observationally, um, especially trying to detect escaping helium from you know, photo evaporation. Now, the reason, um, yeah, so I, in terms of my, of my historical interests, um, I'm actually mostly interested in the history of ancient Rome, but the reason I didn't do a uh, lecture on the history of ancient Roman astronomy is that it basically didn't exist. The Romans, uh, they're, they are a lot like the Chinese actually. They're very, very good engineers. They're not very good scientists. But yeah, if you have any questions about ancient Rome, uh, I don't know, I guess type them in the chat and then I can answer them in the chat. Okay, okay, awesome. That sounds good. Um, Nikita, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a graduate student at Caltech and I'm doing my PhD thesis focusing on the study of accreting supermassive black holes called active galactic nuclei. So I'm an X-ray astronomer and I use a range of X-ray telescopes in order to find out information about the nature and geometry about how material falls in and is orientated around these black holes and just the nature of these um, supermassive black hole systems uh, using spectroscopic data from X-ray satellites. So I, in addition to astronomy outreach and research, I also really am involved in a lot of um, student advocacy efforts and in trying to promote gender representation and increase um, female representation of um, um, scientists in STEM fields. And so I've been doing a lot of work on that front. And I guess just for fun, I'm also very into Japanese culture and I love learning the language and like to read a lot of manga and watch anime in my spare time. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Nikita. Um, Amruta, would you like to, to introduce yourself? Hi, hello. Um, my name is Amruta Zagant and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Caltech. Before coming to Caltech, I did my PhD uh, in Amsterdam. And during my PhD, I specifically studied uh, these stars called neutron stars. These are like the densest objects uh, after black holes in the universe. And so I studied why some of these stars get up to speeds as crazy as, you know, uh, 700 times in a second. Um, I am mostly a multi-wavelength astronomer, so I use X-ray, radio, optical, UV, whichever way you can see light to track these systems, especially the neutron star containing systems, or if there are, uh, you know, like mergers happening in the universe, such as neutron stars and black holes are merging into each other and chase their afterglows with these telescopes. Um, apart from this, I'm really interested in outreach, especially, uh, you know, talking to young kids all over the world. And I participate in this initiative called uh, Skype a Scientist. So if you are a teacher on the call right now, or if you're, you know, somebody who is right now working with a lot of students uh, in these times of remote learning, go to the website of Skype Scientist and you can like connect to thousands of scientists who are ready to come into the classrooms and connect with students. Um, and for fun, I mostly hike, um, bike a lot, and just uh, the other thing I do is uh, restore forest, better uh, post burn forest in an area. So that's me um, and nice to meet you all virtually. Oh, awesome. I didn't know about that Skype a Scientist thing. That sounds really cool. Um, Awesome. Oh, yeah. So I guess I should do a really brief introduction of me. I'm, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. Uh, I primarily do computer simulations, run computer simulations to understand the formation of galaxies and other large structures in the universe. Because when we look out in the sky with our telescopes, um, we see, you know, billions of galaxies out there. But unfortunately, the timescales over which they grow and form and evolve over their lifetimes is very, very, very long relative to uh, human lifetimes. So we can't really see them change. So for instance, everybody knows that the Earth uh, orbits around the sun and it goes one full revolution in a year. 
well, the entire solar system con consisting of the sun and all the planets and such um, is orbiting around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy that you probably can't see from here in Pasadena, but you can see from a lot of sites. Um, and it, but it takes 250 million years to go around that system. So that's the kind of timescales that we're dealing with. And so I run computer simulations where we can artificially speed up time in the simulation to better represent how these things are changing over millions or billions of years to understand how, yeah, how they form, how they interact with each other and what the, what their, what their lives are like. So, um, yeah. And let's see something aside from astronomy. I really like backpacking, trail running. Um, I'm actually going on a backpacking trip to the Sierra this weekend for two weeks. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, but, but yeah, that's it for me. So let's get to the questions. Um, there have been a number of good ones so far. Let's, let's want do one that was, was maybe not a serious question that was asked uh, a bit ago, but I, I still like it because it, it's, it's thought provoking question. And, and that was how on earth did the ancients get so intelligent? And, uh, I mean, perhaps Michael can speak to this, but, um, it does seem like there were a lot of really spectacular discoveries that were made a long, long, long time ago. And yeah, uh, we're still progressing today, but my goodness, they were really able to do a lot with not the same level of technology that we have today. Michael, do you want to speak to that, given it was your talk? Yeah, sure. Well, OK, so the honest answer has to be nobody knows for sure. But we can speculate. We can give reasons. Um, so one reason is that the ancient Greeks, um, they lived on the crossroads between multiple civilizations. Um, they were a trading civilization. A lot of the city-states got rich through trade with Egypt, with Phoenicia, with the, Mid with the Near East. And it's in that way that they, they um, managed to collect ideas from all of these civilizations and compare and contrast them to see which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like. And um, even more conducive to this experiment is the fact that they lived in hundreds of city-states. So every city-state is kind of like a social experiment. right? You can see, OK, this city-state is an oligarchy. Is that a good idea? Athens is a democracy. You know, what are the strengths and benefits of democracy? Sparta uh, is, you know, a very, it's a mixed constitution. It's a monarchy plus democracy plus oligarchy. What are the strengths of that? Um, yeah, so one of the things that really helped the ancient Greeks in their astronomy, and which I didn't have time to talk about, is their, their very solid grasp of mathematics. So I briefly mentioned Euclid's elements. Um, so the elements are, it's basically the first work that we will call mathematical in the sense that it begins with a set of five axioms. From the axioms, it lists propositions that it then proves with the use of the five axioms. So you have the axioms, you prove some propositions, and then you prove more propositions with the help of the axioms and the propositions you already proved. So essentially, this is not an empirical process. It's not like, you know, we know the Pythagorean theorem is true because we measure some stuff and it seems to be true. No, it's actually true because we managed to prove, prove it from first principles. Um, and there's another fun fact about Euclid's elements. Um, the five axioms. Now, the fifth one is obviously very different from the rest. If you just read the uh, original work, it's like much longer than all of the others. And we ask the others are very obvious. If you read them, you'll be like, well, duh, how can it be any other way? When you read the fifth one, you're like, what? Where did that come from? Um, it's called the parallel postulate. Now, Euclid was so uncomfortable with the parallel postulate that he didn't use it to prove like, you know, his first few dozen theorems. He only used it when he absolutely had to because he couldn't make progress any other way. Now, in the 19th century, mathematicians managed to, okay, so in the intervening 2000 years, a lot of people tried to prove the fifth postulate from the fourth postulate. Uh, nobody succeeded. In the 19th century, uh, mathematicians managed to construct 
alternate geometries where the first four axioms are true, but the fifth one is false. They're called spherical and hyperbolic geometries. And we now know that we live in one of those. Under gener uh, Einstein's general relativity, the universe is now flat, it's now Euclidean. Uh, so the Greeks were extremely rigorous in their mathematics. And that really helped their astronomy. Oh, that's interesting. And I know, uh, Amruta, you know something about historical discoveries uh, on the Indian subcontinent as well. Yeah. If you can speak to this. Uh, so, like, there are some interesting things. So, Michael previously spoke about, like, you know, Greek and Indian astronomers interfacing. And I think that really influenced in Indian astronomy towards the 4th BCE. But, I mean, before Greeks came into India, one of the major things that they had discovered on their own was calendar. And so uh, they had a calendar uh, or have a calendar, which is even now like followed to kind of mark out festivals and, you know, like crop and season. And it dates back to about 3000 BCE. And what they figured out was that an year is comprised of 360 days and you split it across 12 months. And then every 60 months, you add an extra month to it to compensate for the leap, you know, the leap time. So this is one of the ancient discoveries. And then the other things that are really interesting is there were there are like installations in different parts of India, even now, such as, you know, Jantar Mantar, which hosts some of the largest sundials or experiments like, you know, like a straight rod or a cross rod. And the straight rod is basically, you know, that, that as the sun shadow is cast, it allows you to, you know, track uh, the cardinal directions and the cross rod tells you what is the angles at which you're like really observing the sun. And so uh, this is called gentle mantra or basic, basically something that translates to magic um, in India. And this is like a really big installation that I even visited when I was in high school. Um, and in between, um, some of the other interesting things were that there were a lot of Indian astronomers, more like, you know, Indian astrologer as, you know, like serving in kingly codes to try and tell the king what are the auspicious times to do something. But these people were smart enough to figure out, like, you know, the sun and the moon setting times to figure out zodiacs. Um, and, you know, like, when would you expect uh, the passing of a certain star? So they have, like, really good star charts dating back to, you know, like, uh, 5th BCE. And one of them, so, like, two of those astronomers or astrologers were called Varahamira and Aryabhata. And Aryabhata has some theory about elliptical orbits that predates Kepler and uh, the, it's called the Aryabhatiya, and in fact, some of the uh, newest space missions that India had are named after Aryabhatta for that particular reason. And it's available in Sanskrit if you're interested in reading things like this. So yeah, it's really interesting, and there are a lot more works like Kerala School, which is the south of India School of Astronomy and Mathematics. Um, they're the first people to come up with the Taylor series approximation. Um, and then in the Bengal, you had the first female astronomer called Khanna in the 12th century. Oh. And yeah, so there are lots of such interesting facts about Indian astronomy, and I'm also exploring them. So. I like that their their uh, observatory was named Magic. <laughs> yeah, it's like Jantar Mantar is like magic, magic, like, you know, like something like a little bit. Yeah. Good job. Um, okay. Uh, additional questions, lots and lots and lots of questions. So we'll try and address all of them. Um, how about, I think this question's for Michael, but if anybody else knows the, the answer as well, are there any popular Roman astronomers? We talked a lot, Michael talked a lot about the Greeks, but you also said Roma Invicta, that you're a huge fan of Rome. So uh, were, there, were there some Romans who contributed to, the, to our understanding of the heavens? Um, basically, the answer is no, because, um, <laughs> yes, okay, so let me revise that a bit. So Ptolemy, the person that I mentioned last, the person that I said was the last great ancient astronomer, he lived in Alexandria, which is in Egypt, but Egypt was part of the Roman Empire at the time. So I guess technically you could call him a Roman, a, you know, a Roman astronomer. 
So the thing with Rome um, is very interesting. So Rome conquered Greece in around the second century BC. But there was a famous saying um, by a Roman. I forgot who the Roman was. But it goes something like, Rome conquered Greece, but, but Greek culture co conquered her savage conquerors. So essentially, Rome conquered Greece, but they adopted Greek culture so much that every educated Roman we hear about speaks Greek and is familiar with the Greek classics and, uh, is, uh, and learns like Greek science and mathematics. Um, so if you read Cicero or if you read you know, Seneca, they make frequent allusions to the Homer, to like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, right? They make frequent criticisms of the Athenian democracy. Uh, they talk about Plato's Republic where he lays out his version of an ideal society. Um, yeah, so in that sense, maybe you could call, call Ptolemy of Alexandria a Roman, even though he was ethnically Greek. I see. And was, living in, and was living and ruling over Egypt at the time, right? Uh, he wasn't a ruler. He was just a scientist. Oh, okay. My mistake. My mistake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a science question for, I think this, this is probably directed at Nikita. Which came first, the supermassive black hole or the galaxy? Kind of the chicken or the egg? What do you think, Nikita? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ongoing debate about how the supermassive black holes that we see today uh, gathered so much mass over such a short period of time. We're seeing supermassive black holes um, form very early on in the universe. Generally, our understanding of how of galaxy formation and how that ties in with uh, the formation of black holes at the centers of those galaxies are Ultimately, you do have gravitational collapse happening first to create, you know, a collection of stars that um, essentially form a rotating system that settles into a sort of equilibrium state, uh, which is uh, essentially a galaxy. And in the center of that galaxy, assuming there is sufficient um, gas infall, then a supermassive black hole can grow quite rapidly at the center over time as matter continues to fall into it and the black hole basically continues to just eat up all that matter. And it and another misnomer is that people think black holes are dark, but they can actually shine quite brightly if a lot of matter falls into them. And this is kind of tying into what I do is I look at how these black holes shine in the x-rays these kinds of black hole systems that have matter, so much matter falling in that it actually forms what's called an accretion disk um, around the black hole system. So yeah, it is kind of a chicken and an egg problem. We don't really know for the most massive systems formed at the earliest, earliest times in the universe, how they grew so rapidly uh, to such high mass. And there's a lot of popular theories out there. One is that they form directly from direct gravitational collapse of a large amount of mass, or that there are certain kinds of populations of very old stars called pop three stars, which are very massive stars that aren't typical of the kinds of stars that we see today in the universe. And just as a quick side note, our last presentation that was given last month by uh, Dr. Andrew Emmerich, which you can see on our YouTube channel dealt with population three stars and their collapse and that sort of thing. So just as a, a side note for, for listeners. Um, how, how does this tie into the background image that you have behind you? Yeah, that's a great question. So this isn't a, a actual like real image. It's an artist's rendition of an accreting black hole system. So in the background is basically at the very center, you can see the black hole and then um, there's an event horizon beyond which uh, nothing can escape. And then where you see all the light coming out is the accretion disk. And if I move back a bit. Um, yeah, you can point to it, the different parts. So, uh, yeah, so you have the, trying to get my finger. <laughs> yeah, the black hole, you have the accretion disk and um, the accretion disk as the material falls into the black hole, um, 
basically light is emitted. And what you see in the far corner here is what's called a corona, which um, essentially what's happening is light from the accretion disk, the sort of um, visible light that we see, gets bumped up in energy within this very hot, uh, basically cloud of gas. And uh, essentially the, the wavelength changes to even higher energies um, to x-rays. And so this corona thing shines very brightly in the x-rays and it's something that I study a lot as part of my thesis because it's sort of the powerhouse of very um, highly accreting supermassive black hole systems or AGN, which shine very strongly in the x-rays. So that's that image. And I can also see that there was a quick question in the chat. Um, how much mass is in the accretion disk around Sagittarius A star? Yeah. So Sagittarius A star is, um, it is a bit of, well, so first, let's just, let's just, I don't think all of our viewers may necessarily know what Sagittarius oh, A star yeah. is, although that, that reader clearly, or that audience member clearly does, but. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Cameron. So Sagittarius A star is the name given to the black hole, to the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, so the thing about Sagittarius A star is that, so there are different kinds of supermassive black holes. There are the really, really highly luminous accreting systems that I study, active galactic nuclei, and they make about 10% of um, all, gal all galaxies. And so they, they are known to have um, you know, these kinds of accretion disks surrounding the black hole. But Sagittarius A star, its activity kind of varies a lot over, over, the, you know, over the history of the Milky Way. And the accretion disk isn't something that's clearly visible or present around Sagittarius A star. And it has varying um, periods of flaring activity and then uh, you know, inactivity, which we call quiescence. So Sagittarius A star would not be classified as an active galaxy, but an, uh, you know, a, a very strong accretingly supermassive black hole system. It, you know, over the age of the, over the, age of the history of uh, the Milky Way, there may have been accretion disks appearing, appearing and then disappearing. Um, so, but overall it's, it is a relatively quiet black hole system. So it doesn't have a permanent accretion disk surrounding it. Perhaps thankfully for us, right? Because if it were a big active thing that's shooting out jets and, and energy, that might not be good for the long-term stability of life and the development of life in the solar system, I imagine. Maybe. We're, we're out in the Orion arm, so I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's not. The jet, it probably isn't directed at us, but uh, anyway, okay. Well, that was great. That, thank you for that. Um, there's a related question in the, in the chat that deals more with uh, the general merger of black holes. Um, like the recent LIGO di discovery that's all over the news the last couple of days. So uh, when black holes merge, they release most of the energy as gravitational waves. Is there a significant electromagnetic flare component uh, in terms of the randomized energy when these, when these two black holes merge? Um, Amruta, I know this is related to your studies. Would you care to comment? Yeah. So, um... So the randomized energy or, you know, like it, it can happen more from the surrounding material in case of black holes. For example, the most recent thing that you might have heard a lot about being covered in the press right now about this intermediate black hole binary merger. Uh, a few months ago, actually, some astronomers at Caltech found that there was an optical flare coming from, the, from this merger. And this optical flare was detected by uh, Zidia, which is a Zwicky transient uh, facility um, on the uh, Palomar uh, mountain. And so they theorized that because, you know, the way the color of this uh, merger falls in the optical observation and, you know, the time scale of this uh, you know, optical flare, it most likely will have arisen because there was a shock wave front that went through the disk or surrounding the supermassive black hole or the active galactic nuclei the, in which the merger actually occurred. The other interesting one such signal that we know so far is from um, 
gravitational wave merger that happened in 2015, like 14th of September 2015, in which there is probably an associated gamma ray flash, uh, which, so whenever you detect gravitational wave, uh, waves because two black holes merge into each other, they are detected by something called as the LIGO interferometers. And there are two such interferometers in the US and one such in Europe. Uh, and so very much uh, like temporally coincident with this merger in 2015, there was a gamma ray flash that was observed when two black holes merged into each other. And so this could have again arisen because, you know, there is a jet that is coming out of, you know, like energy being launched out of this uh, merger that is in form of the jet. And this jet is then, you know, ramming into the surrounding material um, that is around these two black holes. So, so the surrounding material of the black holes is one of the major ways that you can produce electromagnetic emission, you know, uh, as there are shock fronts that go in from the merger itself um, into these disks. So that is one of the most probable ways that you would see either optical or gamma ray flashes. We haven't ever seen yet any radio emission. So let's see, this is still an evolving field for us astronomers as well, because there are lots of theories out there, you know, like for every single possible emission. And it's only with time and more evidence collection that we would be able to figure out which one of them holds. But presumably if the, if the two black holes are oriented such that uh, that jet, rather than running, shocking the material around it, if that jet is, is actually pointed towards us, presumably we would, it would be bright enough that we'd be able to observe that as well? I mean, if it's pointed directly towards us, what we are only going to detect is like a radio flash, but like, you know, not something that is a change in the radio emission levels, and it would be like a constant radio cone that you are kind of sampling through. So... What you would see is enhancement in radio emission in all your detectors, more like a direct background, but it wouldn't be something, uh, you know, because variability studies allow us to understand, like, you know, what is the time scale uh, in the process that's happening inside the disk of this black hole, um, or, you know, how the system is evolving itself. So that is something that we won't be able to do if you're directly exposed to it. So the ideal situation is where we are like partially exposed to it and we get like this side so we can see over time how it fades as well. How it changes. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, some more good questions. Well, let's stay on the topic of of black holes for the moment because okay. there were a few different good questions and we have a couple of black hole experts here. So uh, the recent LIGO event found a black hole within the mass gap. Uh, is there a scientific reason to think such a mass gap should exist or is it that just such black holes are just rarer in terms of, of where we've discovered them? This is a great question, I think. Uh, do you guys wanna, I mean, I, I can help speak to this. We I think we can all at some level contribute, yeah. but um, whoever right. wants to, to start is welcome to do so. Uh, do you mind if I... Uh, right, by all means, go ahead. Okay. All right. So, okay, for those of you um, who haven't yet, um, you know, read about this or haven't come across this, this was a major event um, that, you know, uh, that happened. Uh, it's like um, last year, 21st of May. So, what, uh, most of the black hole mergers that you see in the universe 99% of them involve, you know, like a consolidated black hole that weighs about 43 times uh, our sun. So the probability that you would have a merger where, you know, there are two black holes, both of them really heavyweight black holes that weigh more than 43 times our sun is pretty low. And what happened was there was an 85 times our sun plus a 66 times our sun size, like two, these, two of these, like, really heavy black holes merged and they formed something that is about 143 times our sun's mass black hole 143 times our sun and at the same time uh, this merger released energy as much as about eight suns so imagine our sun has been burning you know for like billions of years will continue to burn for billions of years we get so much energy from it now there is a star that contains all of that energy but like about 143 times and you scale it with cubics and then all of this energy, um, sorry, eight times, and like all of this eight times the sun's energy is released in an instant. 
And so like that's the amount of energy that just like came out of this merger in form of gravitational waves. Um, and so this merger is very rare because usually, as I mentioned before, you would see lower mass black holes merging to form you know, something that is up to 100 solar masses. So we have three different categories of black holes. We have the stellar mass black holes, which are, which are up to like 100 solar masses or lesser. Then you have extremely heavyweight black holes, like something that is a supermassive black hole that sits at the center of our galaxy, for example. Um, like the, the image in Nikita's exactly. or, or rather, she's actually flying around. Yeah. The black hole right now. So. Yeah. And then in between these two categories, you have the middleweight black holes. And these middleweight black holes are called the intermediate mass black holes. Now, there are, so there is like one of the most important limitation in forming heavy black holes as much as like 85 times the mass of sun or 66 times the mass of the sun. It's that in, you form black holes when you have a supermassive star that, you know, at the end of its uh, lifetime would leave behind this consolidated core. Now, what happens is during its life cycle, the star has radiation pressure because the gases are hitting and the energy is coming out. And at the same time, these gases have mass themselves. So there is a gravitational pressure and there is a tension. These two are balanced. Once you reach temperature, which is like up to, you know, 3 billion Kelvin, uh, which is super, super high. <laughs> Once you reach those kind of temperatures, you start some kind of like a fusion reaction where like electrons and protons start like, you know, forming pairs and releasing energy. And this kind of uh, fusion reaction would then lead to an explosion where none of the remnant is left behind. So that, that's, that's the theoretical limit in our understanding of what a star can comprise and what kind of like, you know, process it can sustain to form like the heaviest mass black hole, theoretically. And now, there is this black hole, which is challenging the theory that we have so far formulated, and it, it goes, so why, why do I exist? Or like, you know, why such events exist? And so the answer lies in something called as cascading processes. So cascade is where you don't have one single formation process, but two or more things have to come together. So maybe you are forming these black holes in multi-star system or extremely dense uh, environments like globular cluster, which are star forming factories. So when you have like, you know, so many stars in the globular cluster together, they merge into each other successively. So you start out with two of them merging into each other, then their merger products merge successively into another one and so on and so forth. And you keep increasing the accumulated mass of that black hole leading to such kind of heavy black holes that would finally form an intermediate black hole. The other way to do it is the more exotic way, which is the primordial black hole. These are the remnants of the Big Bang. And this black hole merger that has been seen, the intermediate mass uh, black hole is at about 17 billion light years away from us. So you take 10 and just for an exercise, put 23 zeros behind it. Like that's the number of minds you're looking at when you're looking at such a merger. Uh, so that's how far it is. And so the idea is that um, some of the regions in this universe at the start had, you know, excess amount of matter, which is about 63% extra matter than, you know, we would have at the moment. But so far, the only um, excess that we've seen is up to a level of 0.01%. So this exotic scenario like vanishes. And so there are these kind of different methods and you can also form um, such a black hole if, um, I mean, there is, <laughs> apart from the primordial and the merger of the black holes, you can just do this kind of merger in an extremely dense environment where the black hole over time would suck up because of accretion, all of the, I wouldn't use the terminology suck up, but a lot of the surrounding material into a black hole would keep falling you know, within it and it keeps accumulating mass and puffing up and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why you have these kind of heavy black holes that would form an intermediate one. So that's why this merger is so exciting because we've never seen something like this. And I remember, or do you remember Cameron, like when we started university, intermediate mass black holes were something that is, you know, a myth or something that we would never expect to see during our lifetime. And now we've actually seen it. 
And that's the beauty of this merger is that it's nobody expected this. And it has happened. Well, yeah, I think it's great because as, as both you and Nikita have, have said, we we don't know how to form black holes quickly, like massive black holes quickly, like the ones that are in the centers of galaxies. And we have evidence from telescopes that these things exist very, very shortly after the Big Bang. So they had to form extremely quickly and get really, really, really big, really quickly. And it's yeah. like, people are really like, what the heck? I don't know how to do this. Nobody knows how to build these things as quickly as they, they seem to exist. And so I think the discovery from this week feeds into that as like, oh, maybe it's not as difficult. I mean, we still don't don't fully understand the mechanism. Maybe it's the cascading mechanism that you suggested where it's multiple objects accreting very quickly into a much larger structure on relatively short time scales. Um, but maybe that's that's like nature giving us a hint of, hey, this is how you build things really quickly. And this is how it's <laughs> happening in the early universe. So I think I think this result and presumably in the next few years as LIGO and other gravitational wave detectors become more sensitive and powerful, we're gonna have a big clue as uh, to how to build these things. And it's yeah. really gonna help our understanding of, well, ultimately the growth of the universe, but growth mm -hmm. instruction. And LIGO will get more sensitive because there are more such detectors now coming up around the world. So we are going to push down the sensitivity limit. So we'll catch these mergers which have lower magnitude and are happening further and further away from us. So lots of exciting black holes are coming up. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, just as a really side reference- like a mass gap, oh. so, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like we, at least with yeah. the, you know, we observe supermassive black holes, we observe stellar mass black holes, but everything in the middle, we just don't see at all. And, you know, yes. it's been very difficult to directly direct, detect <laughs> intermediate mass black holes. And we don't know how this most supermassive black holes formed, but hopefully with these um, detections, the theories that we develop to create these intermediate black, black mass black holes may also elucidate to us how these supermassive black holes that we see so early on in the universe also formed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just as a quick side reference for our viewers, um, if you wanna learn more about gravitational wave detectors and detections like LIGO, uh, two weeks ago at our Astronomy on Tap that you can find in our, our, our channel, our videos below. Uh, a speaker, Dr. Brittany Kamai, uh, who's a researcher here at Caltech who works on the LIGO project, was discussing kind of how LIGO works and some of the major discoveries of LIGO. So I encourage you to check that out. It's a really good presentation. Um, okay, so more questions. Let's jump into... Let's jump into helium because there have been a lot of relevant questions. Michael, you said you were doing stuff with, um, you talked a little bit about uh, exoplanet atmospheres, one of the topics you work on, and that you're working on the escape of helium. So why does the helium escape tell us something, or what does it tell us about these atmospheres, and why, why are you concerned about, why are you concerned about helium? Uh, yeah, sure. So the most common planets in the universe are planets that are that we call sub-Neptunes. So these are smaller than the radius of Neptune, which is four Earth radii. Now, but it's, it turns out that this population is divided into two categories. Um, there's one type of planet that's around 1.5 you know, Earth radii, and there's another that's around 2.3. And in between these two radii, you essentially don't see any planets. Now, why is that? Well, so the most um, common, I guess the most convincing theory is the process of photoevaporation, which is maybe initially all of these planets had fairly big, uh, had a lot of atmosphere. So they were all like very big and puffy. But because when a star is young and emits a lot of X-rays and um, extreme UV radiation, that radiation blows off the atmosphere for the smaller planets until all of the atmosphere is gone. So the small planets could be, you know, barren rock, like pieces of barren rock. Um, so by measuring helium escape, um, we can measure the, we can get a handle on the process of atmospheric escape. We can measure how fast it is and um, under what 
con contests what under what um, physical conditions it operates. And in that way, we can understand more about how the current actual planet population came to be. Um, yeah, so actual planet uh, mass loss is also very important to the topic of habitability. Because uh, if you have planets, especially around, young, around uh, very small stars, well, star, small stars tend to be very active. Um, so well, what if the star uh, is active enough to blow away the entire atmosphere? Then you're not going to have life. But unfortunately, small stars are the only stars around which we can possibly find evidence of life in, in the near future, like in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So we are very interested in these small stars. Yeah, so photo, photo evaporation is a really critical process that we need to understand to understand actual planet properties. Awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. That's pretty intriguing. Um, are there other elements? <laughs> Pardon me, coronavirus. Oh goodness. Uh, <laughs> are there other elements uh, akin to helium that can reveal similar things about atmospheric dynamics? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the only reason we use helium, well, first of all, so if you have a pl planet that's substantially bigger than the Earth, um, you expect it to have a hydrogen and helium atmosphere. So, uh, and the hydrogen will take up 90% of the atmosphere and the helium will be 10%. And the remainder, like maybe 1% is made up of other elements. So, okay, uh, helium is the second most abundant ele element. So why don't we go for the first most abundant element, right, the hydrogen? Well, that's what people try to do in the early days of actual planet science. Um, the problem is he the helium absorption line it's uh, 1,200 1, angstroms. Um, so for reference, our eyes can see 4,000 4, to 9,000 angstroms. And 1,200 angstr angstroms is so short that the atmosphere blocks out, out of that light. So in order to see that light, you need to go into space. And there's basically only one instrument in the world that can do this, or well, one telescope, and that's a Hubble Space Telescope. Um, no, the, I don't think there's any other telescope that can take this specific type of measurement. Yeah, no, uh, it's right now it's the only UV UV telescope in, in town. And it's yeah. actually a big problem for my research because when Hubble dies, which is in the not so distant future, we're not going to have any ability to observe the, the sky in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which is a super bummer. Yeah, right. So because you need to uh, use the space, use HST, the Hubble Space Telescope to observe hydrogen escape, everybody wants to use Hubble. Hubble time is extremely valuable. If you put in a proposal, it has like a 10% chance of getting accepted. Uh, if you're trying to do a PhD, that's really scary. Yeah. I mean, well, there's a 10% chance of getting your data and graduate. Right, so um, helium can be observed from the ground. And there's like so many more uh, ground-based telescopes. And those telescopes are bigger than HIC is. So that's a huge advantage of helium. I see. Okay. Uh, the other huge advantage is that there's a lot of neutral hydrogen in the universe, and that also absorbs very strongly. So if you want to measure absorption from the planet, uh, all you can do is measure absorption situated at very high velocities relative to the planet. And um, you know, only a tiny fraction of the outflowing atmosphere is situated at those very high velocities. So it's a very difficult measurement. Indeed. Uh, all right. Other questions to ask? Well, here's a question that, that I can address because it speaks to my particular area of research. What role does the circumgalactic medium play in star formation and galactic evolution? And I almost feel like somebody must be a friend or something because that's not usually a common question that one asks of a, of a Q&A panel. So um, a, a little bit of introduction. So the circumgalactic medium, as the name kind of suggests, circum meaning around and galactic meaning the galaxy. So the circumgalactic medium, and medium is just like stuff, um, gas, we'll say. Most of, most of the stuff in the universe that's made of baryons, electrons and protons like you and me, is in a gaseous form. So, so the circumgalactic medium is the, the, literally the stuff around galaxies. Um, and it extends 
you know, way outside what we typically think of a galaxy. Remember at the beginning, I showed an image of the Andromeda galaxy that had that nice disk. Or when we think of galaxies, lots of galactic, like spiral galaxies have a disk and maybe a bulge in the center. I like to think of them as, as uh, fried eggs because there's kind of a yolk in the center and then there's the disk component. So that's, that's about uh, uh, 20 kiloparsecs across. So about 50,000, 60,000 light years across, just big, right? Um, but the circumgalactic medium extends way, way, like 20 times farther out. It goes out to like 200 kiloparsecs, so like 600,000 light years out. Um, but it's this gas that kind of sits out there, and we don't have a really good understanding of what it's doing or its role in how, how it affects the overall evolution and the life path that a galaxy would take. But that's something that, that I and other researchers uh, in the in the field of galaxy evolution are actively trying to study because it looks like it may have a really, really significant significant and crucial role in in defining how a galaxy moves forward. And that is to say, the stuff that's out there might have some sort of cycle that's regulating how quickly it can fall onto the galaxy. And when it falls onto the galaxy, uh, it will fuel, the cre uh, could fuel the creation of new stars. So essentially, it's like, uh, hmm, what's a good analogy? I don't have a very good analogy. It's like this big reservoir of stuff that occasionally, and occasionally we're trying to figure out exactly why there are different theories about precipitation or thermal instability. Occasionally, it, well, it's kind of like clouds. It's kind of like clouds in the sky. And occasionally a cloud will just float over and do its own thing. And you're like, oh, that's a beautiful cumulus cloud over there. And then sometimes when it comes over, it starts to rain and it dumps all of its, it precipitates down on us. And then we get all wet. Now, of course, we just get wet. But the galaxy, if this stuff rains down on it, that could form the fuel for new stars to form. And when new stars form, uh, some of those new stars that are formed will be very massive and very energetic and probably turn into a supernova explosion pretty shortly thereafter. And that supernova explosion has a dramatic impact on shuffling stuff around and uh, heating up the gas around it and the regions around it, which we do know has a major impact on the evolution of a galaxy, supernovae, which are usually associated with uh, recent star formation. And if this affects the creation of recent star formation, then it could be the, the crucial link that's kind of defining things. So yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what the circumgalactic medium, also called the CGM for short, because astronomers love to use too many acronyms. Uh, and that, that's kind of a, a synopsis of, of the rough understanding of what the CGM does or what it could do for, for defining the trajectories of galaxies and, and why they behave the way that they do over these very long timescales. Um, yeah. Let's see, so more questions. Uh, oh, I like this one. This is kind of a, a general question. Is the energy of the universe constant or variable? Now, one of the first things that we learn uh, in our science classes, whether it's in chemistry or physics or, or biology even, is that in a closed system, certain things, certain laws appear to be, I mean, they were called laws because they were defined before we got into like theories and everything. Once, once something was so clear cut that it was a law, it was unbreakable, like the law of universal gravitation by Newton, which of course was kind of broken by uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. I mean, not entirely, it was just re, it was, it was filled out in more, more, uh, more general terms. But the, law, the laws defining conservation are pretty, pretty hard cut. Uh, so there's conservation of energy in a closed system. There's conservation of angular momentum in a closed system. There's conservation of linear momentum. Like if, I, if my mouse is moving along here and it bumps into my hand and it, or, or, or billiard balls on a, on a pool table, uh, that, that momentum has to be, to be conserved in that system. So, um, the fact, I mean, do you get, I'm just yapping here. Do you guys want to chime in? Yeah, go ahead. I like okay. the analogy of billion balls on moon, by the way. Like, <laughs> yeah. Or like 
infinitely smooth surface, just like going on and on and on into distance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we apply the conservation of energy and, you know, in all our physics calculations. And yeah, we always assume that like, when the universe was created, there was like a, a total fixed amount of energy yeah. and it can only, you know, change form, but you cannot just create energy out of nowhere. Right. The, I think the idea of energy is super interesting because it's not, you know, you think about energy and you might think about like fossil fuels or, 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 or something like that. But energy is this abstract concept that just re represents something that you can't physically see. And as Nikita says, it can transform from one form to another, whether it's uh, kinetic energy. So how quickly, again, my, my mouse, how quickly my mouse is moving across the screen. Um, it's storing energy in its motion relative to its surroundings. But if it slams in, like if I throw it and it hits the window and it shatters the window, it'll stop, but its energy goes into breaking the window panes, breaking the molecular bonds between the, 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 the glass molecules, but also in terms of acoustic waves. So it will hear a big, I'm not gonna do it because I don't wanna pay for a window. But um, we'll hear a shattered window. That's acoustic waves that are coming off of uh, the, the, the breaking of the glass and we'd hear a shh. That's another form of energy. So there's all these different ways in which energy can, can exist. But as Nikita says, it should, be, uh, it should be conserved in a closed system. And we believe that the universe is a closed system. Strangely enough, if you um, apply the standard cosmological models, at least like naively, it seems like energy is not conserved. Because there's a form of energy called dark energy, mm -hmm. uh, which has constant density per unit volume. Now, the problem with that is that the universe is expanding. So the number of cubic meters in the universe is going up. But this energy has constant energy density. So it seems like you're creating energy out of thin air as the universe expands. True, if you believe that the universe is finite in volume. But if it's infinite in volume, I mean, that's when it gets tricky to just think about because you have an infinite object that's expanding also mm -hmm. into infinite. And then you're like, oh, I can't think about infinity. You're just doubling the infinity. You're just increasing right. the infinity. Right. <laughs> and also but, the uh, thing that with radiation, um, okay, so the energy, the total energy in the universe attributable to radiation goes down uh, faster than the um, universe expands. So another way to put this is the cosmic microwave background, the light emitted at the beginning of the universe, the temperature of that has been going down. Uh, whenever the universe expands by a factor of two, the temperature goes down by a factor of two. So the, it would also seem like uh, the energy in radiation is going down. And even empty space, we think there's nothing occupying it is actually filled with virtual particles coming in and out of existence. And that has energy of its own. So mm -hmm. this is all, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot you could take it in terms of different forms of energy. And you know, I, read of a I read a debate. Conservation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read like a debate between Sean Carroll and somebody else, um, forgot who, might be Roger Penrose about like whether in general relativity, energy is still conserved. Um, and it was quite a technical debate. I admit I didn't really understand it, but the upshot of the debate is there's no ambiguity about what the uh, laws of general relativity say. Like if you make both of them, if you ask both of them to make a prediction, they'll give you the same prediction. The only debate is about semantics. Like it's easier to say that energy is conserved or to say that is not conserved. You know, which one, uh, which one is a simpler description of reality? And uh, I, I'm not qualified to weigh in on that. Okay, um, a couple of questions related to the content of Michael's talk. Uh, so one of the questions was uh, related to time periods were there any significant contributions to astronomy made by the Sumerians prior to, prior to the development of the Greek society and, and the Greek contributions? Um, yes, the answer is definitely yes. 
felt the Sumerians were the oldest civilization to exist in the Middle East. Um, it's from the Sumerians that we get our system of timekeeping. So the fact that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, and I think even the fact that there are 24 hours in a day, um, that comes from the Sumerians because the Sumerians had a base 60 system. Um, so the, there's another thing that comes from either the Sumerians or the Babylonians, uh, probably the later Babylonians, because I don't think that it's this early, uh, which is a lot of what well, a lot of the precursors of algebra. So remember when I say, said that Thales was a very good student who learned from Egypt and Babylon? Well, what he learned was um, essentially the precursors of algebra. Now, the Babylonians were especially impressive because they um, invented a process that's reminiscent of integral calculus. So, okay, um, they measured the speed, the position and speed of Jupiter to take a random example. On day one, day two, and um, day three. Um, okay, so they know the speed of Jupiter at these three times. Now, how, what is the distance that Jupiter covered? Um, yeah, so to figure this out, you know, they essentially subdivided the periods and um, inter used, used interpolation to find the speed at intermediate periods. Um, and then said, okay, in this small interval, the, speed, the distance traversed is speed times uh, the time. And they, they, they added up all of these periods. It's not quite integral calculus because I think they only subdivided things once, but you know, it's a nice precursor. Yeah, that's pretty impressive considering it didn't get invented until the 17th century. And, and so they preceded it by like 2000 years more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, um, so we, we discover, we've discovered a lot of Babylonian clay tablets. And on the tablets are um, math problems. Now, what these probably were, either they were instruction manuals for students or they were students' homework problems. <laughs> and, the, and the problems basically say, okay, um, this is the problem and this is the procedure. And then it gives out the procedure. And then the final sentence is, this is how we calculate this. This is how we calculate uh, this problem. Now, one of the, I think the most interesting thing I found in those tablets is a proof of the quadratic formula, right? The quadratic formula, B equals, I'm forgetting everything. Negative B equals, plus or minus the square root of 4A squared over 2A, something like that. Yeah, or, that's, that's something like that. Anyways, I remember, remember when I was in high school, the teacher like had a, re a really long proof of that using completing the square or some method. The Babylonian method is geometric and so much more obvious. Huh. Interesting. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, another question. So this question, I think, is directed at Nikita. Um, since you were talking about Sagittarius A star earlier, what, what does the star in Sagittarius A star mean? What does it stand for? I think it represents... I'm not entirely sure of the answer, so someone else wants to pitch in. Um, so the way we even detect the presence of Sagittarius A star is uh, not really from the light that it emits directly, but from the gravitational motion of stars um, in the vicinity of the black hole. So I think my understanding is that the star kind of signifies like one of, like the actual star that is orbitary, like, or, like orbiting Sagittarius A star. I think the, what I've always heard is that it was um, first detected as a radio source and the star, the asterisk that we, we say a star represents that, but it may be because you're absolutely right. And there are some wonderful animations. Uh, I encourage the audience to look up, to type in Sagittarius A star or even just black hole at the center of our, of the Milky Way. And you can see these beautiful images that Nikita's referencing. Um, People have been taking images of the of the of this object for a long period of time over the course of the last like 20 years, 20 or so years. And you can see the stars that are close to it doing orbits around it, but there's no object that they're orbiting around. So you know that because you see these objects doing these orbits and you can measure the time and the speed at which they 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 do that, you can figure out the mass that's in that spot. 
but it's not glowing. So we know, I mean, like I said, there's some radio component to it, but, uh, but not enough to figure out like what's there, but, but that basically reveals the mass. And the fact that, you know, that's this huge mass, that's um, a few million times the mass of the sun in such a small spot. The only thing that we know that can, that can fit that, that behavior is, uh, is yeah. black. So um, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the reason, um, I like Sagittarius's discovery is because it was like by the father of radio astronomy, Jansky. And at that time, he just like recorded it as like kind of a signal that's coming from this towards this center of the galaxy. And he just like made a note of it. And then at that point, you couldn't really like guess that this was actually a star. And then it, you had to wait from like 1930s to up to like 1982 for the interferometric observation, which again happened with radio observation to really like pin down that this is like a star that is going around the uh, back hole. So, yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. Um, we'll take a couple more. We've only got about 15 minutes left, but I want to hit on a few more questions. Um, for X-ray telescope users, what options exist other than the Chandra X-ray telescope? I can start and Amruta can also pitch in. Okay, great. Um, so there are a lot of X-ray satellites out there um, in orbit. So a t telescope that I use a lot as part of my PhD research is called the New Star. Uh, telescope and it's very unique in that it's the first focusing X-ray telescope in orbit that focuses very high energy X-rays. And this is a, a very difficult feat to achieve because X-rays, as you all probably know, are very high energy and very hard to bend the light. And as you increase the energy, um, it becomes harder and harder to deflect uh, the photons. And so New Star was pretty much the first telescope that had the technology in place, which is essentially layers and layers of multi-layer optic coatings with uh, different density uh, material uh, composing them, which essentially creates this physics effect called Bragg reflection, which increases the reflectivity of your mirrors. And this enables the telescope to bend these really high energy X-rays. And that's been really great in opening a lot about what we can learn about systems like black holes and binaries because um, those very high energy x-rays we can get spectroscopic data now from that and a lot of the interesting features that can give us information about these black hole systems and their fundamental properties are actually you know hidden in this very high energy data there are a lot of new X-ray telescopes also being launched into orbit. Um, one that was launched, you know, quite, just a few years ago as uh, the NICER, which is a neutron star interior something, something. Uh, Amrita knows the full um, abbreviation. But yeah, that telescope focuses a lot on trying to study the interior compositions of neutron stars. And it's aboard the um, International Space Station. And really recently, there was another telescope launched um, between a joint collaboration between uh, Europe and Russia called EROSITA. And it is taking a lot of data right now um, of the X-ray sky. I'm, I'm muted, sorry. Um, I think EROSITA provided like an incredible, they put out the first all sky map of the X-ray uh, sky or at this level of resolution and sensitivity and it's amazing it's an uh, that was a couple image. of months I ago recommend you just yeah, yeah. Erosita all sky x-ray map um, um great I, there was a there was a kind of added question that one of the members of the audience asked and that was why do we have these x-ray why why are there x-ray telescopes and you know it's a good question but I think the main thing that astronomers are trying to do, we're trying to understand the universe. And the main way in which we can do that is looking at light that's coming to us from those parts of the universe. Cause it's very difficult for us to, you know, for me to go to that 
that star over there or that dust cloud over there, it's much easier for me to take my telescope or my binoculars and record photons that are coming from that and then trying to do something about the conditions there or what's going on. And one way in which we can do that is not just looking with our eyes at visible wavelengths of light of the electromagnetic spectrum, but sampling the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum, whether it be in the radio, as Amruta was talking about before, or in the X-ray, as Nikita was just discussing, or in the ultraviolet, as Michael was discussing, uh, or now something that's even outside of the electromagnetic spectrum, the gravitational wave spectrum, which was, uh, you know, the discovery of which was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years ago for uh, the amazing work done by the LIGO detectors. And now there's an increase in the number of, of these kind of observations that are being done both on the ground as well as hopefully in space soon. Yeah. yeah, like every object out in the universe, you know, to pick to piece together a full picture of how that object form, why it's behaving that way, you want to try and sample the entire spectrum of electromagnetic waves as possible because each wavelength can give you a basically a different lens into the behavior of that object. So this is why you know why X-rays, why why optical, why ultraviolet, you know any. Anything. If you see an exp if if a supernova explosion goes off, you don't you see it first in the optical, but you want to follow it up with every other wavelength out there to see are we seeing this explosion happen across the spectrum, and that helps piece together how this thing exploded and how it might evolve. So um, just one quick point adding to that. Also think of it as an analogy, like, you know, you have different types of cameras, right? You have like a wide field camera that samples like, you know, like a big scene if you're trying to shoot uh, maybe like a valley at the same time. So you have like wide field instruments, like wide field X-ray telescope that look at a large patch of sky at any given point of time. So if anything goes off uh, in that patch, it would detect it. It's called the monitoring of space. And then you have like more focused mission, missions that just focus on singular objects and try to collect photons from that particular object with like, suppose the idea is you want to take a portrait of a person and you need to use like, you know, a specific lens uh, if the person at, as a, is at a given distance, right? And you try to do that with X-ray telescopes as well. For example, NICER, which Nikita mentioned, was designed specifically to understand what do neutron stars comprise of. Um, and they've designed a telescope that is very sensitive to its lower energy would collect a lot of programs from new, neutron stars and then would yield you or uh, like give you an answer to that question. So that is the idea. You just change and use different lenses to look at the sky. Yeah. The other analogy that I like is just in colors. So if you're just looking at things with your eyes, it's like looking at just everything. You can only see stuff that's emitting red light or scattering red light. But if you look at X-ray, you might be seeing the blue light that's coming from it. And in the ultraviolet, you might be seeing the green light. I mean, I, this is an analogy, right? So you're trying to see a full color image of the objects that you're seeing. And uh, if you're just limited to one part of the electromagnetic spectrum, you're really limiting what you may be able to see or what you're able to learn about what's happening in the universe. So, um, OK, so one last question that I think all of us can speak to. Uh, one of the audience members asks, asks, I see so many of my high school students in your faces. What inspired you to study astronomy in particular? Do you have any favorite astronomers that my students might relate to as well? Um, yeah, so I think everybody can, can contribute to this. Who, who would like to talk about kind of what were their inspirations for going into the field? And are there favorite astronomers or or something that continues to inspire you that, that you'd like to recommend to other people? Who wants to start? <laughs> I mean, I can start. That's easy. Uh, so I actually, um, you know, I give the, the standard, the standard thing that a lot of astronomers had this experience. Uh, when I was in elementary school, my father brought me to uh, an amateur astronomy group that was set up on our on a parking lot in front of my elementary school when I was in like third grade and we're observing uh, Jupiter and Saturn 
much like you could do tonight if you had such a telescope, uh, observing that in the sky. And so I was like, oh, this is pretty awesome. Uh, and I got, I got it. I, I was just always really into natural sciences and trying to understand the nature of the, the world and our place in it. And I actually studied computer science as an undergraduate uh, and eventually kind of shifted more towards doing computational aspects of astronomy and astrophysics. But, but yeah, I've just always really been interested. I, I just don't think there's, I think one of the most uh, inspirational things that you can do with your life is try and better understand the natural world and share that understanding with the rest of civilization. So that's why I'm excited to work on this. I can go next. Um, okay, Nikita. So kind of like Cameron, I also uh, got interested in astronomy at a very young age. I think I was just always just really fascinated when I looked up at the night sky as just, you know, like a five-year-old kid, just how vast and mysterious it seemed. And um, in my early childhood, I, um, you know, I read a lot of astronomy books. And I think one thing that really sort of kind of made me want to pursue this in the long term was um, in this book that had an image of um, very famous image, which was of the Hubble ultra deep field, uh, which you can look up, which is um, essentially Hubble just pointed at a blank patch of the sky for 11 days, just uh, looked at that blank patch. And lo and behold, you could see thousands of galaxies all pop up. And uh, we were looking back down a 13 billion light year corridor. And even just reading that as a kid, like you could see light from 13 billion years ago. Um, you know, if you just stared at the sky long enough, it really, um, yeah, it was really mesmerizing for me. And, you know, just even things like uh, identifying my first constellation, like or, which was Orion and you know, seeing the Orion Nebula and being like, wow, I'm looking back in time. Like, this is how our, the Nebula looked like 2000 years ago. It really kind of um, really inspired me to uh, want to study astronomy in the future. So um, in undergrad, I, I studied physics with the intention of um, pursuing astrophysics research in grad school. And I think that sort of, you know, that interest in backyard astronomy um, as a kid is just why I'm really into doing astronomy research in the present. And um, it's unfortunate we don't have stargazing um, events right now, but I hope we can get back to that again in the future. Me too. Me too. Uh, it's, it's always fun to, to have the opportunity to look at the sky, but also share that experience with with everybody else in the in the public. So hopefully we will have that opportunity again soon. I actually have one of the telescopes here in my in my apartment that I snuck out. So. so can I point at the second part of this question, which is like what what are our favorite astronomers that right. you know their students can relate to? Um, and so there are some really uh, amazing people. Uh, so if you go online, uh, if you're a young student who's on TikTok, I would say follow someone called Hilo, Hil, Hilois Stevens. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she's a French astronomer uh, currently in New Zealand, I think. And she does a lot of informative videos for you know people uh, who are coming from all walks of life. I would also say some of the astronomers that in current time that I find really interesting um, is Katie Mack, uh, Katie Mack and another person called Emily Levins. Both of them wrote really amazing books recently. One of them is called, I think, uh, Katie Mack's book. Do you guys remember? It's called uh, All the, I think it's something on the lines of All the Different Ways the World Can End. Uh, and, you know, very prompt book to, like, you know, very apt book to write in 2020. Um, and then there is another book by Emily Levens called The Last Stargazer. So if you have a chance, go read it up. It's a really beautiful book. Um, so these are some of the astronomers in current time I find really uh, inspiring. Uh, also on YouTube, Dr. Becky Smirhurst. Uh, uh, she's amazing and she does like a lot of videos, including what does an ordinary day look like for an astronomer. Um, so yeah, I would say these could be amazing people to relate to. 
Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I forgot to answer the second part of that question. I think for me personally, um, you know, sort of like a role model and an astronomer that I really look up to and is alive in the present day is Jocelyn Del Burnell. She was the first astronomer to discover radio pulsars. So pulsars are um, rapidly rotating neutron star systems. And if you just, you know, read about her and, you know, watch some of um, uh, some of her presentations, um, her journey um, throughout, you know, her academic career is, is quite um, tremendous. And it really, it shows you just how, how, how many struggles and challenges she had to face as a, as a woman at the time in uh, trying to defend her results and how she also got scooped a lot. Um, throughout her career, her, her research advisor ended up being first author on, on her discovery paper and got the Nobel Prize. And, you know, she faced a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, unconscious and conscious gender biasing. And it's just her journey is quite incredible and in how she, you know, overcome a lot of things like imposter syndrome and became such a successful astronomer is amazing. And also just reading about how back in the day, like she even discovered the first radio pulsar, like looking at all these like, sheets and sheets of of you know basically um, pencil recorded data and essentially just making markings and like analyzing all these huge records and just finding one tiny blip in that data it's it's really um it's, it's incredible how they how they you know in the in the era of the internet you know we really are um very lucky in in the kind of resources we have available to us now well, I guess it's my turn to answer the question. Um, yeah, so I've, I've also always been interested in astronomy. Um, I especially liked the really big numbers, like 10 to the 32. Um, I guess back in the day, I would have been a pretty enthusiastic Pythagorean because I like numbers so much. Uh, anyways. Join, join I, the, the number cult. <laughs> yeah, yes, the number cult. <laughs> I'll worship the number zero instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've all, I, I was also very interested in backyard astronomy. Um, I remember when I was, how old was I, like 11, I, I, I had the idea, uh, okay, so I know about solar eclipses, kind of like any of the planets cause eclipses. Uh, so then I looked it up, um, I don't know whether it's Yahoo, it was Yahoo or Google at the time, but somehow I looked it up and I found out, oh my God, there's a Venus transit in just a few months. Um, and by coincidence, like I had a pair of binoculars at the time. It wasn't for astronomy at all. It was just for, you know, looking, looking like, you know, it, it was just for random things, right? Like looking at the nearby building. Um, so then I looked up a method to use the binoculars to watch the Venus transit. Uh, it's called the projection method. And I saw the Venus transit. And like, I think that was the first astronomical observation I did that wasn't completely trivial. Like, oh, there's the moon. Um, yeah, and when I was 13, my dad bought me like uh, uh, one of those department store telescopes. Um, it's not very high quality, but even with a like low quality telescope in Toronto, you could see quite a lot. I mean, I could see Andromeda, I could see like globular clusters, star clusters, you know, definitely out of the planets. Um, yeah, so in university, I, I was always unsure what I wanted to study. Um, I took a lot of classes in physics. I took a lot of classes in computer science. And um, I think it wasn't until the end of my second year, like right before we had to declare our major that I took an astronomy class. But the t professor of that astronomy class was a very good advisor. Uh, her name is Netta, Netta Bacall. So one day we happened to be in the same like that dining hall and she was like, so do, do we want to sit together and talk? And, and I said, okay, sure. Um, and then over the course of that conversation, she convinced me to join the astronomy department. Um, you know, I, it, didn't, it didn't take a lot of convincing. I was already interested in it, but she convinced me that exciting things are happening in the field. You know, this is, this is a time of rapid progress. Um, it's now the time of the Romans in, you know, the third century AD. And yeah, so that's how I came to be an astronomer. 
Okay, uh, very fast. Do I have any favorite astronomers? Um, I really like the story of Henry Cavendish. So Henry Cavendish was this English astronomer uh, from the 18th century. And he was always like pathologically shy, which reminded me of like the person I used to be and still am to some extent. So he was so shy that once upon a time, he had an admirer who came to visit him. He traveled like all this way, right? They didn't have planes back then. Um, and then he knocked on Cavendish's door and Cavendish was so afraid that he ran out of the house and could not be induced to come back for many days. Um, anyway, so Cavendish was the first person to measure the gravitational constant. So if you, knew, if you know Newton's law of gravity, uh, it says that the force of gravity is proportional to the two masses and to the inverse of, of the square of their distance. But there's a proportionality factor called G. Uh, nobody knew what that was. So he set up an experiment with like two lead balls on the balance and a third lead ball like, um, like on, the, uh, on the floor, very close to one of the balls on the balance. And he watched for the extremely minute rotation of this balance that was hanging by a tiny thread. He had to like wait a long time to get all of the tension out of the thread. And he had to like basically build an airproof room so that no air currents would disturb his measurement. But anyways, he got the measurement to like within 1%, which is really amazing. Um, I think he was also the first person to make hydrogen, which is something that I did when I was young, um, just for the fun of it. Uh, so yeah, he I really it, he made it through it. electrolysis of water or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You use salt water and you pass a current through it. And on one of the um, electrodes, hydrogen is evolved, and the other one, uh, chlorine. And you really want to get rid of the chlorine. It's not good for your health. Because I know you can do it without salt water and you just get oxygen at one and hydrogen at the other. I didn't, interesting about the chlorine. I guess right, we yeah. it before. Yeah, you need an electrolyte to, um, that dissociates huh. um, to, you know, oh, like OH and, and ion. So sure. for example, if you use NaOH and you dissolve that in solution, you can get hydrogen on one electrode and oxygen on the other. But if you just use water, the resistance is basically infinite. Yeah, I see, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Oh yeah, Michael. Uh... Somebody had asked a while back, if you could spend an evening around a campfire with a Greek astronomer, which one? Yes. Okay, um, Thales of Miletus. Uh, mm -hmm. Thales of Miletus, because he was the first one, he was the first astronomer in Greek history, according to all of the ancient sources. And the so, first philosopher too, right? Yeah, he was a philosopher. Um, yeah, so he, he's a very interesting person. Uh, here's a nice story about him. Uh, one time he was walking along but he was looking at the stars because he was so absorbed in studying them and then he tripped and fell down a well and there was a servant girl who uh, saw this so she got him out of the well but then she mocked him she was like you as philosophers you're always looking at the sky you don't see what's at your feet and i think that's the first instance of the absent-minded professor <laughs> so that stereotype you know is very ancient goes right. back to the very first philosopher to 2700 years ago nice yeah so he was the first i want to know how he did it like where did he get this great idea you know mm -hmm. how did he start this like epic intellectual journey now we're still continuing to sure. this day all right well thank you panelists thank you very much michael that was a wonderful presentation and thank you to our audience members for for sticking around and for contributing such wonderful questions uh, that we could try and address. Hopefully we, we did it to your satisfaction. Um, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are a series of monthly events. Our next one will be um, October 9th, so about a month away from now, about dark energy, which we talked a little bit about tonight. It's called uh, Trying to Prove Einstein Wrong. And it's by a postdoctoral fellow named Agnes Ferte, a French astronomer in the department who works on the dark energy survey and uh, works in cosmology. It's, it's going to be a great talk. And then in November, we have kind of a, a famed astronomer giving our presentation. It'll be Dr. Katie Bauman, who uh, is a professor at Caltech. She, she rose to a lot of stardom in the news a couple of years ago 
with, with the discovery, with the imaging of the black hole, the supermassive black hole in a neighboring galaxy in the Virgo cluster. And you may have seen in the news, there was an image of a woman who was kind of uh, associated with developing the computer software for being able to, to couple all of the different astronomical telescope data together to be able to generate this image. So um, she'll be giving our talk probably on the topic of imaging supermassive black holes, what that, that whole, her research is about. So, um, and then we have Astronomy on Tap coming up in three weeks about Planet Nine and unseen objects around the solar system, which should be super good with Konstantin Batygin and Jackie Faherty. So thanks everybody for sticking around and we will catch you, catch you next time. Have a wonderful evening and a good weekend.